Good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for joining us this morning. I'd like to welcome you to this session on behalf of Frontier Economics and the UK Trade Policy Observatory. Um, and this is session 43 of uh, the inaugural Geneva Trade Week. And I'd like to begin by extending a thank, uh, my thanks and the thanks of the panelists to the, um, the organizers, uh, particularly uh, Dmitry Grozbinski, uh, Joanita Kalibala, and Michael Omumbwa. And I would also like to thank our uh, host for this morning, Ms. Antonio. Um, before we proceed, just some uh, housekeeping rules to bear in mind. Uh, the panelists, uh, there are four panelists, they will speak first. And uh, following their presentations, there will be a time for discussion. Please feel free to send questions uh, to, um, to me um, and the panelists via the chat box. And these can be taken up in our discussion session. The presentations will appear on your screen. Um, and um, as we proceed, there will be uh, some polls that are put up, one in particular during uh, Emily Lidgate's presentation, and I'll flag when that happens. Um, and I should also say that at the very end of uh, this session, there will be a survey which you are invited to complete. Now, the theme for this morning is um, trade and climate change. And uh, we have a slightly sweeping and grandiose title towards a new grand bargain for sustainability uh, without protectionism. Uh, behind that uh, title lurks a series of policy challenges and issues. We've been familiar with these for quite some time, but it's fair to say they've come into very sharp focus uh, in the last few years. Both the um, uh, international regime for, uh, for, for climate and, uh, and for global trade, both these regimes are set up to deliver what we might call global public goods. Uh, for climate, it's a stable concentration, atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases. Uh, for trade, a stable and an open trading environment. And it's not a very profound observation to say that neither systems are working particularly well at the moment. Uh, and there's a real risk now that uh, with climate issues uh, coming very much to the forefront of people's uh, uh, preoccupations and political concerns, there's a risk that um, efforts to mitigate climate change run into trade rules and put unsustainable pressure on the trading system. And equally, that trade tensions, which have proliferated over the last few years, jeopardize the uh, the scope for multilateral cooperation across all fields in trade and climate particularly. So we're in this unst unstable and unsustainable equilibrium, if you like. And one key challenge that we face is how do we move to a situation where both uh, trade and climate change regimes help to support each other and lead us to, to better outcomes? Because this is Geneva Trade Week, the, the focus really will be on finding uh, tools from the trade policy toolbox uh, to deal with this situation. And how we are to proceed, how we get to uh, a new grand bargain that promotes both sustainability and trade is the challenge before us. And in order to help us with that, we have four panelists who I'd like to introduce, um, starting with Matthew Bell. Uh, Matthew is uh, the chairman or uh, is, the, is the director of uh, Frontier uh, Economics. Um, he leads public, public policy practice. And before joining Frontier, Matthew was the chairman of the Committee on Climate Change in the UK from 2014 to 2017. Uh, the Committee on Climate Change is a statutory, statutory body in the UK, which was established to make sure that uh, the UK meets its legally binding commitments uh, on um, that it's set for itself in terms of greenhouse gas reductions. I'm also delighted to welcome uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Isabel Durand, who uh, is from Belgium, but she at the moment is the Deputy uh, Secretary General uh, of UNCTAD, and she's been in that position since November, uh, since uh, July 2017. And uh, Ms. Durand brings to this panel a, a vast experience based on a, a very distinguished career in Belgian and European politics. Uh, she notably held the office of Deputy Prime Minister in Belgium. She was the Minister for Transport and Energy, and she was a Senator in the Belgian government. Uh, she's also served as Vice President of the European Parliament and Presidency of the European Union Council of Ministers of Transport. 
in the current capacity in UNCTAD, uh, Ms. Giroir is obviously very much at the fore of the interaction between uh, trade and climate change, with obviously a very specific focus on the concerns of uh, developing countries. Um, uh, Isabel will be followed by Dr. Emily Lidgate, and uh, Emily is a specialist in international trade law at Sussex University, uh, uh, where she's also the deputy director of the UK Trade Policy Observatory. Uh, and Emily has published interactive. Uh, uh, Emily has published uh, extensively on international trade law, um, and she's focused particularly on the implications uh, of trade law for the protection of the natural environment. Uh, she's also consulted with UNEP. Uh, and acted as UNEP's liaison to the WTO. So she is very well placed to, to speak about the interaction between trade and climate change. And finally, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome Alan Winters, who's a professor of economics at Sussex University and director of the UK Trade Policy Observatory. Uh, that's based there. In fact, he was the founder of the UK Trade Policy Observatory. Um, he is a leading contributor these days on Brexit, so he's taking a break from that to speak on less complicated issues, I imagine. Um, uh, and to this debate, he brings a, a very rich background from uh, 2008 to 2011. He was a chief economist for the British government's Department for International uh, Development. Uh, and from 2004 to 2007, he was the director of, of the development research group at the World Bank. Um, so, with those introductions uh, done, I'd like to turn to our first speaker, um, who will be Matthew. And I asked Matthew to speak first because uh, he will essentially set the scene from a climate change perspective and, uh, and present to us as trade uh, people primarily. You know, what are the main asks from the climate community uh, and from a climate change perspective when it comes to trade and trade rules? Over to you, Matthew. Thank you very much, Jamar, and uh, welcome to to everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here this this morning. Um, as uh, as Amar said, I, I come to you from the world of climate change negotiations, laws, and climate change economics. On on some days, I think uh, climate change negotiations are far easier are a far easier environment than trade negotiations. On uh, on other days, I think it is far harder, and uh, we'll see. We'll see how we go over the next uh, over the next few years. What is what is certainly true is that the two worlds are coming together. So if we proceed to the first slide, uh, beyond this one, there we go. Um, the two worlds are coming together. They're they're coming together because of the breadth of the issues covered by climate agreements. The Paris Agreement, ratified by 189 countries is now being translated into domestic legislation by all of those countries. The chart on the top right shows the domestic climate laws passed by countries around the world. Many of those predate the Paris Agreement, but momentum has certainly increased since 2015. The legal framework created by the Paris Agreement is designed to keep global temperature rises well below 2 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. To be consistent with the Paris Agreement, the laws that countries are passing need to put countries on track to meet their commitments under that agreement, and where they extend to 2050 or beyond, to be consistent with achieving net zero emissions. The national climate laws that enact the Paris Agreement are not only binding on local policymakers, but are increasingly being enforced through the courts. The chart on the bottom shows the number of court cases that have been fought around the world to enforce climate obligations. The US stands out for the number of cases, but Europe is quickly catching up and many countries are now seeing action through the courts. This time last year, the Dutch Supreme Court upheld a lower court ruling ordering the government to do more to meet its existing climate commitments. Most court cases are about enforcing a particular regulation or a particular law. What was notable about this case was the court ruled on the overall package of measures put forward by the government against its ambition for reducing total national emissions. The government appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, not because it disagreed with the facts, it knew it had to do more to meet its commitments, but because it did not think the court had jurisdiction to rule on such a case. Many see the Dutch court decision that it could rule on the case as an important precedent on the ability to enforce climate commitments. <clears throat> 
All of this matters for trade because governments are increasingly under both political and legal pressure to take action on climate issues that affect how they think about trade. We move to the next slide. Within the last 10 days or so, many of you will have seen President Xi Jinping of China announced China's ambition to be carbon neutral by 2060. In a country that still has tens of millions of people earning less than $2 a day, that's a remarkable statement. It effectively says that the Chinese government is confident it can break the link between economic growth and carbon emissions. There is emerging evidence from elsewhere that is possible. For example, in the UK, GDP pre-COVID grew by over 80% since 1990, while emissions fell by over 40%. But so far, the UK is the exception and divorcing economic growth from emissions growth is a very significant challenge. The European Commission looks set to increase its climate ambitions to reduce emissions by 55% from 1990 levels by 2030 on its path to net zero. There are clearly contrasting views in the US, but there has been very significant state level action and the potential for more federal actions too. Even before all of these formal changes, Presidents Xi and Macron were clear in signaling that trade agreements had to be compatible with climate commitments, as the quote on this slide demonstrates. Organizations have been reluctant to create hurdles to trade, such as the IMF, are increasingly recognizing that the differential speed of progress on climate issues may need action through trade measures. The instrument of choice and an increasingly prominent topic of discussion are carbon border adjustments. Carbon border adjustments add a tariff to goods coming into a country based on the carbon intensity of the product. They aim to ensure that imports pay the same carbon price as domestically produced products. But in practice, the interaction with trade goes well beyond the discussion of carbon border adjustments. We look at the next slide. Since no country has a carbon pricing system in place commensurate with its climate commitment, Achieving those climate commitments requires a significant intervention by governments in their domestic economies. In addition to meeting their commitments, some countries see a first mover advantage in large scale intervention, the chance to establish leadership in particular new and rapidly growing industries or areas of knowledge. COVID itself has provided further impetus to governments keen on doing something in response to its economic consequences. The result will be a rising tendency for more interventionist economic policies by governments of all political persuasions. Support, whether through the tax system, financing, regulatory measures or others, may be extended on a very large scale to sectors such as the automotive sector, energy, steel, cement, pharmaceuticals and many others. Where that support is not in line with existing trade agreements, it is the trade agreements that will come under pressure and not the domestic policy decisions designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We proceed to the next slide. That brings us back to carbon border adjustments. Having taken often costly, sometimes controversial measures to reduce domestic carbon emissions, governments are more and more keen to ensure they have not simply replaced high carbon domestic production with high carbon imports. A study just released yesterday looks at extending the EU emissions trading scheme to encompass imports of products such as steel and cement, ensuring EU-based and overseas-based products face the same carbon price. Frontier Economics' own work for the Carbon Zero Commission estimates that proper carbon pricing on steel could increase UK's competitiveness against many sources of steel imported into the UK. The EU executive has said it will produce a draft measure for implementing carbon border adjustments in 2021. As one analyst remarked, it is almost certainly true that the rush to carbon border adjustments likely underestimates the complexities and the uncertainties in their implementation. It is also true that, to quote a saying, the train has left the station. The support for such measures is now unstoppable. Governments feel they cannot justify ever more domestic effort to reduce emissions without putting in place greater assurance that their trading partners are doing likewise. That may lead to certain requests 
from the climate community to the trade community? How can different degrees of climate related intervention by government in their domestic economies be consistent with trade law? How can new industrial policies be consistent with existing and new trade agreements? What helpful guidance is available from the trade community to governments grappling with difficult climate issues? So that brings us squarely back into your world. Climate scientists have spoken, notwithstanding some wobbles here and there, increasingly economists, lawyers, and politicians involved in climate issues are now also speaking with a single voice. There will be significant action to try to limit the damage from climate change. In some ways, the job of the WTO and the broader trade community is to ensure that the real benefits from trade are not lost in that move to reduce climate risk. And ideally, that trade actively supports the Paris Agreement and its objectives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for that uh, very compelling uh, presentation that sets out the scene from a climate perspective and a number of key questions that you've raised. Uh, I'd like to turn now to uh, Isabel Durand. And uh, um, Isabel, you, you speak in your own capacity, but you come from, from the, the trade and development community uh, uh, in the form of UNCTAD. And I think Matthew raised some important questions regarding uh, the delinking of economic growth and carbon emissions and the challenge that uh, that presents. And it's a particularly acute challenge for developing countries who are faced with uh, really two a two pronged challenge. One is that they're particularly exposed to the uh, consequences of uh, climate change. And the other one is that uh, they face uh, a big task in ensuring both sustainable uh, uh, sustainability objectives and poverty reduction objectives. Um, so I would uh, welcome your thoughts on, uh, uh, on these issues, Isabel, and I, and I hand the, the floor to you. So, um, um, good morning, everyone. And first of all, um, before entering into the core question that you that you asked me of how trade and climate can progress hand in hand, I would briefly come back to the current situation and the current context because what Matthew said about uh, the necessity, the, the new statement of different uh, Mr. Jipping, Mr. Macron, Madame uh, Georgieva, and all this important person. It's true, but uh, it's also true that we are now in an unprecedented uh, crisis with the COVID-19 and the socioeconomic consequences of COVID-19. And it will, it could be to a certain extent helpful, but it could also be a problem in order to go further and to apply or to implement the nice statement that we that we heard. So just to, to rem remind on economic terms that we, we are expecting a contraction of the GDP, uh, uh, more or less 4.3% on worldwide in, 20, uh, in 2020. So that's, that's uh, uh, enormous. We have also the, the risk to lose uh, a million um, of uh, jobs. We have an immense challenge re uh, because we are expecting uh, a reduction in trade around more or less 15%. Uh, foreign direct investment of 40% and diaspora returns for the developing countries of around uh, 100 billion. So that's a situation in the developing countries which will be absolutely uh, uh, horrific regarding economic aspects. So um, we know also that the previous crisis, 28-29, uh, um, it was also a, a, a crisis that hmm, we, we didn't address correctly, and it has left a rate of inequality between countries and within them unsustainable debt, debt fiscal and environmental and climate debt. So the situation, the basic situation, it's not really uh, uh, easy in order to, to really work on, on uh, climate change on a good way. But we know also that the biggest decline will be in the developed world, but the greatest economic and social damage will be in the developing world. And that's also changed the perspective of the negotiation in the, in the future. 
So this is the context that we must think and advise government for the recovery phase and beyond. And the current crisis has also highlighted challenges that can be, to a certain extent, turned into opportunities and feed very well our discussion of this morning. Uh, the, for instance, I take one example on the, the tourism sector. The tourism sector, it's more or less 1.5% of the, the worldwide GDP. That's, that's really a huge sector economically. But the terrible shock that has affected the tourism sector uh, in all its dimension, uh, its hospitality, uh, food, etc., etc., and transportation, for some countries that represent more than 50% of the GDP, and so this, this uh, highlights the importance of supporting uh, uh, economic diversification. And that urgent call for economic diversi diversification can possibly be an opportunity for the development of green sector uh, and green technology, supporting directly the Paris Agreement that we, we discussed this morning. We know also that the COVID crisis has also highlighted the need to shorten and regionalize value chains to ensure better control, transparency, redistribution along this chain. Reinforced regional markets is another opportunity for trade and climate to fulfill their purpose of solving global collective challenges. And finally, the recovery package or stimulus packages should also seize the opportunity of boosting green sector and sustainable trade. And we all, uh, we all know that this will not be a simple task and that the risk is high of seeking short-term solution and help instead of, of changing more deeply the model, especially in developing countries. So I will now address more closely the relationship between the trade negotiation and the trade and the climate negotiation and allow me to do so through the lens, of course, of the developing countries. I believe we have a good platform this morning to put on the table the main challenges and the main question linked to our objective of integrating climate concerns and climate targets uh, into the trade negotiation. But a first challenge is, uh, uh, is, is, is like that. Our work at the WTO today should emphasize the need to revisit and revise trade rules to ensure they allow countries to adopt ambitious national climate policies fully fit for meeting Paris uh, Agreement commitments, and Mathieu spoke about that. And this would be an easy task uh, if we lived in a world with a common global carbon tax scheme and all countries adopt uh, similar climate policies. But the real world is very different. And uh, it's a, a difficult task because there is no universal carbon tax and countries' national climate policies vary in scope and ambition. So in international negotiation, the international principle of countries' common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capacities, reaffirmed in the Paris Agreement, permits developing countries to take more time to raise their levels of ambition to reduce CO2 emission. Moreover, the Paris Agreement stipulates that developed countries must provide them with technical and financial assistance to enable them to achieve and ultimately strengthen their emission reduction targets. And I would say it's not uh, always the case, and the discussion about this fund is a very, very huge and difficult discussion. And it will be the case after COVID-19, because developed countries, of course, uh, uh, the relief package and all what they what they decided to, uh, to do and to pay uh, in order to support their own sector will, of course, not help to, to use money to support developing countries. So the discussion on global trade uh, rules must, must consider the development angle of the new rules and the limited capacities of developing countries. For example, a gradually declining exemption for development tax should be uh, considered. Another challenge is linked to the functioning of the carbon tax itself and how we quantify the emission uh, of a country X. So if the emission of, of, let's say, Morocco only takes into account domestic production without taking into account the pollution impact of its important products, the global system and the global fight will, of course, never uh, work. And the third challenge, more question that comes to my mind for our discussion is, what will trade looks like at 2.3 degrees? And I am convinced that we need to develop more the perspective, the prospective dimension and get a clear picture 
uh, of the change that will occur in the trade flows with an increased temperature, because it will be the case, even if something is decided soon. What does a plus three degree uh, means for trade routes, for commodities, for transport option, etc.? And until now, too little has been done on, the, on that picture of tomorrow, and tomorrow comes fast. Um, I would also uh, um, um, speak about the, the, the position of the, the developing countries also in the WTO. For them, they know that the Doha round was never really applied, it was never concluded and, and never applied. And um, uh, we know that uh, they, they, the position of the developing countries is so different to negotiate. It's true for the digital sector, it's true for the climate issues. And um, uh, many hope that enhanced trans trade liberalization is in environmental goods and services, and the elimination of non-tariff barriers could facilitate action to mitigate climate change and other environmental problems. But after years and years of negotiation, which were actively supported by UNCTAD uh, research and inter intergovernmental dialogue, expectation that uh, an agreement could be crushed has completely faded. And WTO members could not agree on an approach to negotiation that could deliver benefits to all countries, and as a result, this negotiation failed. And more recently, at the 11th WTO Ministerial Conference in Buenos Aires, uh, several WTO members called for the WTO to launch a discussion, only a discussion, on ending inefficient fossil fuel subsidies that harm the environment and contribute to climate change. Unfortunately, this proposal was not adopted uh, by other members and thus a potential contribution of new trade discipline to the fight against climate change was lost. The same with fisheries. You know that's also a problem which is not solved and which is really problematic for not only for climate but for environment globally. So uh, I think that uh, um, uh, we have to, of course, to revisit the rules in the WTO, and it's why I'm not so, so I think that the question that Matthew highlights with the court in Netherlands and the, cap the capacity of the court to intervene in the debate, why not? It's the case for trade, why not for climate? And I think that that's also maybe an evolution which could be uh, helpful in the future. Finally, um, I, I'm very happy to listen to the academic people and in order to look how we can really look at climate change and trade differently, because I'm, I'm sure, I know, that trade negotiators are never speaking with a climate negotiator. In each country, everywhere, it's two different segments and they are never speaking together. We organized last year a common a workshop with a, a, a negotiator from trade digital sector and climate sector. It was the first time sometimes that negotiators from the same country met in Geneva together and discovered that their country is, is taking some position in the, the trade negotiation or in the climate negotiation. So I think that we, we it, there is a, a necessity not only to have nice statements, and that's important in order to accelerate the trend, but also to change the mind of the negotiators and the technicity of the negotiation in climate, in trade, and in the digital world are so technical that we are losing completely the biggest picture, and especially the capacity for the developing countries to be really part of the negotiation. And uh, sometimes I take the comparison with a, uh, uh, um, um, a, a guy with a bicycle uh, and another one with a car, a very powerful car. And when, when you, you have to start a negotiation where you, are, where you are not equipped to discuss, to understand all the challenges, the technicalities, and the, law, the, the legal aspect uh, in front of uh, law firms supporting developed countries, it's true that for the developing countries, I can understand that they are a little bit reluctant, especially after the failing of the Doha uh, rounds. So we have to take into account all those aspects which are not technical, but it's really the sensitivity or the, the feeling of those countries in this very difficult discussion. Even the developing countries are also facing climate change concretely with problem of uh, uh, food security uh, and all the aspects related to the effect of climate change in their country. So I just I wanted to explain politically how I feel the situation 
But I, I thank you for organizing this discussion because I think that it's really, really, really timely and we have to do more very, very quickly. Otherwise, we will lose the next decade. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel, for that very comprehensive and powerful presentation and for bringing to the table the, the, the very central aspects of uh, development-related issues in this debate. I think both Matthew and Isabel have uh, painted a very comprehensive picture and a lot of common points that emerge. One is that we are in a world where interventionism uh, is in on the uh, order of the day because of the priority attached to decarbonizing economies and meeting the challenges of both decarbonization and growth. And both um, uh, Isabel and Matthew uh, emphasized uh, how far that uh, these requirements you know, raise questions from uh, of trade rules, uh, raise the need to revisit trade rules. And I think Isabel also pointed out the need to think maybe into the future about how trade looks like at 2.3, uh, above two, uh, 2 degrees centigrade. Um, given that it's difficult to deal with trade rules in the current temperature, that might be a, a bit a, a big ask. But um, I turn now to Emily, who I think is ideally placed to respond to some of these questions, as someone who specializes in trade law and its interaction uh, with climate change. In, uh, in the course of this presentation, a poll will come up uh, to which I invite you to respond, uh, and we'll gather in the responses uh, in the course of this presentation. Over to you, Emily. Thanks, Amar. Um, so I think what we're looking at today is really an old or at least a sort of middle aged problem, which is how to undertake the economic transformation that's necessary to mitigate climate change um, while maintaining open trade um, and, and how to do it in a just way with respect to global inequalities. And I thought I would start with um, with a starting point of net zero targets, because I think they give a sort of a sharper edge to this question. Um, so this map shows uh, countries, uh, not just countries, not regions, that have committed to net zero targets, with apologies to New Zealand. I'm not sure uh, what happened to it. Um, so on the one hand, we have um, you know a really notable trend. On the other hand, this is still quite limited. So um, the US, China, and India, for example, the top three global emitters, um, not not included. So in a sense, it's a more pessimistic map than 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 this than the one that um, Matthew put up. But I think it's useful for for sort of just uh, underscoring that in a sense the root of the of the trade and climate problem um, is that these countries don't want to be stuck with a bill. They want their industries to remain competitive, and so their instinct is to seek to restrict trade, be that through imposing strict regulatory requirements on imports, through border carbon adjustment, or through propping up their industries with subsidies. Um, but it's, of course, not inconceivable that this map will change in a very short period of time. So we can imagine, for example, both China and the U.S. Um, lighting up within the year. And that will really change the conversation um, because the more we can have, um, and again, just underscoring the points of the previous speakers, the more we can have a global agreement on climate, robust global carbon price, technologies marching quickly in the same direction, um, and everyone working together to divest of fossil fuels, the less we have to, the, the WTO has to act as the sort of arbiter of, of the legitimacy of climate change regulation. But in the meantime, we have this, tension. Um, and this morning, sort of for lack of, of time, I thought I'd make some comments on this tension specifically with respect to subsidies, because the WTO subsidies and countervailing measures agreement has been sort of in the spotlight quite a bit with respect to its potential thwarting of uh, climate change mitigation subsidies. Um, so if we take existing WTO disputes in this area as a kind of a proxy for what are the issues, um, almost all of these have centered on the concerns about local content requirements that are associated with um, renewable energy subsidies. So, in other words, this is formal discrimination. It's not even dealt with under the subsidies and countervailing measures agreement. So, it doesn't seem to me that there's really compelling evidence here that the WTO is acting as a sort of a breaking mechanism on, on climate change subs, uh, mitigation subsidies. But I definitely don't think that this means that such subsidies are sort of WTO proof, because if we if, if we think about it, we're looking at 
a massive global program of, in, of government investment. And if we think about something like, you know, for example, AOC's uh, Green New Deal, um, we can certainly imagine based on the sort of the scale and the time frame of, of that economic transformation clashes emerging. And I think that's particularly the case as some of the subsidies we're, we'll, we'll be moving into more and more are on goods which are heavily traded as opposed to many of these disputes which focused on electricity, which is not. So I think that so far so good is, is certainly not enough here. Um, and I've outlined four potential or uh, possible solutions to, to potential conflict between climate subsidies and the subsidies and countervailing measures agreement. I think you could probably apply this kind of framework to other areas, um, but I'll just look at subsidies. So um, the first option is change the rules. And this is where a huge amount of academic attention has focused because, of course, as academics, we clearly have all the answers. Um, and we've looked at ways of, you know, there's been lots of different interesting proposals for ways of reforming this, uh, the SCM agreement that they might include revivifying the non-actionable subsidies category. So you have a, a carve out there. Um, they might include uh, creating new categories along the lines of the agreement on agriculture. And there's um, a sort of form of entertainment amongst academics of debating whether GAT, the GATT general exception applies to the SCM agreement, which, by the way, um, it doesn't. But I think the problem is that even though we can um, probably agree that the SCM agreement is not ideal because it's an agreement that doesn't have a sort of carve out for environmental um, subsidies, um, reform doesn't seem to be very close to actually happening in negotiations. So. Uh, for example, the EU, who we might look to for leadership in, the, in this area, um, its recent concept, concept paper doesn't even mention green subsidies, but instead focuses on um, where a lot of the attention and subsidies reform is right now, which is putting pressure on China about state-owned enterprises. So this brings us to the second option, reinterpret the rules. Um, and this is what the appellate body famously did in the Canada renewable energy dispute. It created this concept of a new market. So, and essentially what this quote amounts to is that when you're trying to decide whether a subsidy is, is giving a benefit, you can't actually compare wind or solar um, energy with con or electricity with conventional electricity. They shouldn't be in competition with each other. Instead, you have to compare with other wind and solar. And what this does is create a tremendous amount of, of this sought after uh, policy space for new green technologies. Um, the downside, of course, is that it was heavily criticized as a sort of a Pandora's box for new industrial subsidies. And also it relies on an appellate body who can make creative interpretations of the treaties and perpetuate precedents. Um, and that's certainly not where we are today, um, and that doesn't seem to be where we're going. And I think this brings us nicely to my third option, which is ignore the rules. So, um, and I put up this particular slide to immediately uh, reveal some of the potential downsides of that approach. So, these are three different estimates of, of recent UK fossil fuel subsidies from three different bodies. Um, I'm picking on the UK here, <laughs> which is obvious, but it's obviously not unique in giving uh, fossil fuel subsidies, um, quite the contrary. Uh, but what you can see here is that the UK government has decided that it doesn't give any fossil fuel subsidies whatsoever. Um, but the OECD has, has, a, very, has, an, has a different estimate and, and an EU uh, tri uh, trinomics report commissioned by, by the European Commission has, has a completely different estimate. So I think this chart says something about the problems with subsidies generally and fossil fuel subsidies more specifically, which is that they are to some extent in the eye of the beholder and that notification and, and transparency are real challenges. So in this case, the UK's methodology for calculating um, its subsidies doesn't capture these fossil fuel subsidies. And I think this is a little bit like Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, you first have to admit to yourself that you have a problem before you can think about uh, coming to a, a solution. Um, and I, I would say that this also um, is a problem for renewable energy subsidies because uh, 
we, we're operating somewhat in, on the WTO level in a void of information because of the lack of notification of renewable energy subsidies. We don't know what's happening as, as well, and therefore we can't begin a discussion about what are the specific issues and what are the legal questions. So, um, of course, this is just about transparency and notification, but when it comes to actually subsidizing as well, uh, we have a similar issue. So I was really struck by this is last year's global trade alert report. And if you look at the, the growth areas in terms of um, biggest source of increase in harmful trade policy instruments, despite all the attention on tariffs and tariff wars, it's actually that light blue category, which I know it's, it's a bit difficult to see, but it's that the biggest bar, that light blue category is um, trade distorting subsidies. So subsidies are where countries are really um, letting loose and in the G20. And this, of course, predates COVID. So you can imagine what this might look like in, in the next uh, global trade alert. So um, I think that ignoring the rules is a growth area, um, and, but I don't necessarily see it as a climate friendly strategy. Um, first, because it could just as easily let through sort of generous cutbacks to fossil fuels industries. Um, but second, because I, I would hope that transparency would, would lead to more constructive discussions and more action. So, you know, information for, for transformation. And this leads us to the final option, uh, subdivide and conquer. And what I mean by this is plurilateral or FTA um, or bilateral efforts to coordinate on climate policy and climate goals. Um, and these might serve to further the goal of reducing fossil fuel subsidies. So this is the case for Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidies Reform or free trade agreements like the Agreement on Climate Change, Trade and Sustainability, which is currently being negotiated um, by New Zealand, Indonesia and some other countries. Or they might serve to sort of enshrine uh, policy space for green subsidies, as some recent EU FTAs have done. Um, and the hope with this, as with sort of FTA negotiations in general, is that if you create a plurilateral dialogue and commitments, this will then sort of seep into or influence the multilateral um, negotiation space. So I think there's certainly you know, promise in the approach, keeping in, mi keeping in mind, of course, that even if green subsidies are permitted by FTA partners, they could still be challenged um, in, in the WTO. So here's a, a traffic light uh, recap. Uh, change the rules, um, great idea, doesn't seem feasible. Uh, reinterpreting the rules, uh, given the problems with the, um, with the above, <laughs> it could be a necessary evil. Um, but probably hampered uh, quite a bit by the current dysfunction in WTO dispute settlement. Um, ignore the rules. Um, burying our head in the sand is not a good strategy for achieving climate change mitigation. And subdivide and conquer, uh, certainly not without its limitations in terms of multilateral challenges, but probably overall a promising avenue for creating and consolidating climate friendly reform to subsidies rules. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Emily, for that comprehensive overview uh, from a legal perspective. And um, there's a poll that was put up, and I will circulate the, the answers at the end of the, uh, the panel session, speaking precisely to your traffic lights here. So we'll see what the audience thinks. Um, I'd invite you in the audience, as we approach our last speaker, to send questions through to, uh, to us so we can uh, respond to them and give you the floor as needed uh, during the interact interactive session. Our last speaker is Alan Winters. And um, so, Alan, you have the uh, either enviable or unenviable task, depending on how you look at it, of, of pulling all this together and offering some solutions from an economic point of view. I think um, we've, flamed, we've framed the, the key asks from the climate community to the trade community through the prism of trade rules. But behind trade rules, uh, lies or should lie a body of economic thinking that informs uh, decisions about these. And so I, I turn to you and to your wisdom to, to shed some light from an economic perspective on these questions. Over to you, Alan. Well, thank you very much, Amar. Thank you, everyone, for listening as well. I mean, that's quite a build-up. I 
I'm not quite sure that in 15 minutes I'm going to get it all sorted out uh, for all time. Emily has talked about subsidies. I am going to try and work sort of from first principles, but to think more about uh, trade barriers. Um, uh, 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 both Matthew and Isabel talked about bringing the trade and, in, and environment or climate communities together. And I think that is very important. And part of the secret of that is to try and understand exactly what you are talking about and ensure that in some sense one side doesn't feel that the other is encroaching on things that perhaps they don't understand or they don't own or uh, they haven't really uh, fully thought through. So in some sense what I'm wanting to do is use some economics uh, to narrow the scope of the conversation so that we can really be clear where climate and trade policy um, uh, start to um, interact. Ah, uh, okay, so that's a full slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about economic theory of economic policy, a uh, theory of second best, and then I want to talk about some um, uh, border carbon adjustments, and then um, international agreements, or uh, again, um, um, uh, plurilaterals, in the sense that Emily used the term. Um, I'm going to start off with just the theory of economic policy, um, and that really uh, is essentially saying you need to work out exactly what the problem is. Um, it, supposing the only thing in the world that matters was emissions. It's not even clear then that trade would be a problem because it's certainly possible that uh, the carbon embodied in uh, domestic production exceeds the carbon embodied in foreign production plus the cost the carbon involved in carting the stuff around. Um, so it is possible that the, the trade is in fact a solution uh, rather than a, uh, uh, the problem. And for instance, there has been some work on uh, cut roses from Kenya. Uh, this was brought home to me in January this year, uh, depth of the British winter. I bought some daffodils for my wife to cheer us up and was deeply shocked to see they'd been grown in Lincolnshire, uh, the coldest bit of England in January. And you just can't help feeling uh, that growing flowers where the sun shines might be more efficient uh, than uh, growing them in Lincolnshire. Um, the issue essentially is you know, home and foreign emissions might differ for all sorts of reasons, some good, some bad. And uh, one doesn't want to sort of, as it were, honour the bad reasons by compensating for them. But essentially, you've got to understand what that is. The issue that we've got is, in a sense, that production methods, uh, the, 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 the way we're producing stuff anywhere, or indeed what we're consuming, might matter more to uh, carbon uh, uh, emission uh, uh, the, the, than actually uh, the wear question. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, you know um, climate is very important, carbon is very important. But there are, in fact, other things that matter, and among those is uh, eating and other elements of uh, economic welfare. So we've got a couple of estimates that suggest that uh, um, nearly a third, uh, from Christia, um, uh, nearly a third of trade reduces emissions relative to autarky. In other words, actually importing stuff and paying the carbon in the transportation is more uh, carbon efficient than growing it or producing it yourself, but that trade actually increases emissions overall. And similarly, uh, work by Shapiro more recently suggests that trade overall uh, increases um, uh, emissions by about 5%, um, but overall it raises welfare. So that even though emissions are going up, once you count uh, the efficiency can, uh, it allows you to eat more, eat better, uh, have better shelter and so on, uh, welfare is higher. So in fact, we are in the world that economists inhabit of making trade-offs. That really is the, the important issue. Now, if you've got sort of several different things that matter, uh, we get thrown back onto the economist's favorite bit of theory, I think, uh, which is that uh, um, um, uh, market distortions sort of interact. Uh, sort of curing a distortion in one 
uh, area is not necessarily going to be overall uh, welfare improving. Now, there are some areas where climate and trade are pushing in the same direction, or uh, environment and trade, uh, Isabel mentioned them. Fossil fuel subsidies are just the, such an obvious place to start. They distort energy markets, they distort the climate, and uh, it really is just appalling that we haven't managed to work that out. Uh, similarly, fishing subsidies. The, the case for having competing subsidies of the fishing fleets is just difficult to comprehend. But there are other places where they interact in more complex ways that, that mean that there's a trade-off to be worked out. And uh, one of these is, for instance, in the situation that a trade liberalization reducing tariffs might actually lead to emissions uh, increasing. Under these circumstances, the general theory of second best says there is no general answer. You just have to take the case and work out carefully in this particular instance you know, do the pluses outweigh the minuses or not? Now, if we uh, sort of combine second best with the uh, theory of economic policy, it essentially says you want to intervene as close to the problem that you've got, or actually intervene close to the margin that is going to address it. So if, for instance, the problem is that we have consumption bundles that mean we just like consuming uh, carbon intensive products, then indeed we need to tackle this with some sort of consumption policy. And that presumably would be something that taxed goods for consumers um, according to their carbon content. That would have by itself very few WTO implications. Uh, essentially, it will be non discriminatory and it is perfectly consistent with the WTO to have excise taxes or other forms of indirect taxes, as long as they don't make a distinction between uh, well, between different suppliers from abroad or between foreign and domestic suppliers. If, on the other hand, the problem is production methods, that we know how to produce some stuff in a fairly clean way, but don't bother, we actually rather use uh, dirty methods because they are cheaper, then indeed we need uh, production policies. And among the production policies, of course, a carbon tax is um, uh, among the most prominent, but it's not the only one, carbon markets or indeed uh, possibly other forms of regulation. Um, now, the point that takes me to this sort of question about border carbon adjustments, um, one of the issues that greatly exercises uh, economists is that if policy is to be efficient, it essentially needs to be even handed in the sense that you don't single out particular activities and penalize them. You single out what it is you don't like and let activities sort of shuffle around uh, so that some are deemed uh, sort of infeasible and others are, uh, are feasible, uh, profitable. So that one needs to have a sort of even handed policy. In other words, if you are worried that uh, consumption of a good is, is harmful in climate terms, you need to reduce all consumption regardless of where it's produced. Now, the problem with production policies is that they are local. They disturb competitiveness. Uh, you can, a government can only uh, implement a policy uh, pretty much on its uh, local producers. And that raises the question of carbon leakage, uh, imports displace domestic production, and the imports indeed are more carbon intensive. And the border carbon adjustment is, as I guess everyone who's bothered to get uh, up early enough to come to this session, uh, you know, understands that's where the border carbon adjustment sort of tries to re redress the balance. The big problem with border carbon adjustments, it seems to me, is not the principle, but the technical problems in actually setting the rate. You need, if a border carbon tax adjustment is going to have the um, effects that we hope, essentially it has got to be pretty specific to the amount of carbon that that particular good embodies. You've got to be able to distinguish between you know, essentially clean and dirty products. 
that requires huge amounts of information. Indeed, to do it very precisely, it requires information that we just do not have to hand and is almost certainly open to a great deal of uh, manipulation. The problem is if you don't do that, if it's not actually based on the energy use of the specific product, you're essentially undermining the incentives for people to innovate to reduce their carbon, uh, um, uh, carbon consumption in production. Uh, so that essentially what one is trying to do if the issue is incorrect, inappropriate production technologies is tax the ones that are dirty uh, in order to let the ones that are clean um, uh, come forward. Now, that sounds all very direct. What in fact we hope is going to happen in general is as a, on top of that process is a, a sort of strategic uh, element that one hopes that in some sense border carbon adjustments are going to encourage or have a wider impact than just that little bit of trade that they are levied upon. In other words, if a border carb carbon adjustment encourages a producer to have a clean version of the good, we hope that they will then start using that clean version in all the places they sell the good, not just in the place that is imposing the border carbon adjustment. Um, and they're only going to have that strategic effect if they're imposed on very large markets. Um, and uh, that's sort of relevant, I think, if we sit in the UK, which, as all of you are aware, has had a great thing about sovereignty in uh, the, the last few years, uh, this notion that uh, the efficient thing to do is go alone. Um, the, the UK is clearly too small to have any material effect on anything very important in the world as a whole. Um, and so far as uh, UK policymakers are concerned, if they are looking to encourage other people to change their behavior around the world, they are going to have to do it in cooperation uh, with neighbors or like-minded um, uh, like countries. Now, there, there are some parallels with this. The Mon Montreal Protocol seems to have been quite successful in dealing with ozone-threatening chemicals. Um, it had very, very particular circumstances uh, in its creation, it had a, quite a lot of support, even among the industry that was going to be affected. And so uh, it's not clear that that's a generalizable parallel. Uh, the other area that is uh, what I want to finish with is just environmental clauses in free trade agreements. Um, increasingly, free trade agreements embody um, environmental clauses, uh, including climate. Um, and um, they have, I mean, they, there's both the sort of, do they exist, don't they exist dichotomy, but they also come in many different shades of gray. And um, I uh, have, uh, with a young colleague, uh, Julia uh, Manton Garrett, um, started to look at these, or actually Julia has started to look at these, and I'm kibbutzing, if I'm honest. Um, essentially, the issue we've got is the following. Free trade agreements are designed to encourage trade. So if trade on net is increasing carbon emissions, free trade agreements seem prima facie like to likely to increase carbon. What we find is, in fact, if they have uh, these um, uh, environmental provisions, we can't find too much evidence that trade between the two partners to a trade agreement uh, is changed very much in its e emissions intensity. But we do find um, an interesting result that suggests that North-South free trade agreements, so this is things like the um, EPAs of the European Union, do seem to affect the emissions intensity of developing countries' incremental exports. Um, essentially, when you sign an agreement with someone who's going to try and enforce it, it does look as if it has spillover effects to other export flows, not in the sense that countries stop doing what they were doing previously and do something different. No one signs trade agreements that dramatically change production. But what they do do, it seems, is influence trade on the margin. So I've, I've drawn two little uh, figures here to sort of try and capture what is going on. 
first is energy intensity. So think about the energy intensity emissions over exports of a developing country's exports. They sign a free trade agreement, and instead of sort of declining along the path that they would be taking anyway, the free trade agreement appears from that point onwards to reduce a bit the energy intensity of all of their of the developing countries' exports. In terms of overall emissions, however, you've got two effects going on, and the effect might be uh, net positive or net uh, negative. The issue essentially is that now I'm looking at total emissions, uh, this is what the level of exports is uh, before the free trade agreement is signed. When you sign the free trade agreement, exports jump. That's the purpose. That's why countries are signing free trade agreements. So in some sense, you have a jump up this old relationship. You trade more, there's more carbon emission involved on that on average. But thereafter, the growth of exports is associated with a lower growth of emissions than it would have been. So has this saved uh, the climate? Has this uh, done had climate good? Well, in a sense, it's depending uh, just in climate terms of uh, the relative size of this jump relative to the change in this slope. So we've got pluses and minuses, and again, one has to sort of work out what the trade-off is. If you think the world is set on a path that exports are always going to increase, eventually cutting their marginal uh, emissions is going to uh, improve the situation climate-wise. But essentially, I think the, the point here is that it's not just a matter of in, uh, environmental provisions. You have to think about the whole picture. And it seems to me that if climate uh, scientists, economists are going to sort of have some sensible meeting of minds on these things, we've got to get these questions sort of narrowed down so that we know exactly what it is we're discussing. I have had, I have to say as an economist, far too many conversations that I'm told that trade is bad, we've just got to control trade. And that elicits uh, a rather hostile reaction inside my heart. Actually, what I want to do is identify exactly where it's going wrong. Is it that we've got too big a jump here? Is it that we've got too small a step down here or what? And then try and focus our combined uh, interventions on that. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, for that uh, presentation. And thank you for uh, setting out quite clearly the contribution that trade can make to uh, uh, to uh, enhancing the prospects of reducing emissions, or at least the growth in emissions. I want to pick up uh, on your last point on um, on FTAs, uh, because I think it was also raised by Emily and also by Isabel. Uh, I think Isabel in her presentation referred to the regional regionalization of solutions and particularly the, the formation of regional um agreements between countries as a way of both enhancing their development and environmental uh policy prospects um isabel would you um, like to comment on uh, uh, alan's findings regarding free trade agreements and uh particularly the, the scope for north south free trade agreements and how from a development perspective you uh, you see that yes because uh, uh, I have another engagement. But briefly, um, to comment what Alan said and, and globally, I think that the free trade agreement that we are, that we are witnessing regularly, showing how now today we would like to, to really ask to trade to solve a lot of problems which are not solved in another place, political place. I mean, for instance, uh, all the aspects related, for instance, for the when I look at the Mercosur agreement between EU and uh, that's something which is now really a political problem because a lot of countries refuse to uh, to really uh, implement it that uh, in the national or, or regional parliaments because of the question of Bolsonaro and all those aspects related to Amazonia. But even if they agreed, how could we control, for instance, in this case? the role of the Brazilian authorities regarding Amazonia, how we will really have something which, which is the tool of the constraint. If you put some conditionality 
uh, in the free trade agreement, you have to have the ways to, to really control the implementation of those con conditionalities. That's another problem because, of course, uh, it's now a political discussion and not really a technical discussion on how we will control the implementation. And, and I think that um, the development people are not really so often speaking with uh, the, the trade people as such, except in UNCTAD because that's our job. Uh, but uh, some, they, they are really uh, separated as it is the case for the climate negotiator and the trade negotiator. So I think that we have, and I liked the, the presentation of Emily with the colors, because yes, which are the ways that we have to choose in order to go a little, a little bit step further. And uh, I think that um, it's the same for the, 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 the free trade area or the, the, the free trade agreement, or we, we have also to look which are the conditions that we would like to put in and be able to control the implementation of that and the, and, and the sanction if there is a, a no respect of the of this conditionality is the same for gender. Huh? Gender is now the new mantra in trade, gender and trade. And I agree that trade is not neutral regarding gender, but well, you could put a chapter on uh, gender issues in the. But if you don't have data, if you doesn't have uh, uh, capacity to control, if you doesn't have capacity to sanction, if there is no respect of gender perspective in free trade uh, agreement. What does it mean? I think it's just uh, gender or, or, or um, gender um, uh, washing <laughs> or, green, or green washing. So that's the, the really that we have also to work on. So I'm sorry, but I have to go because I have another engagement. So I would like to continue this discussion and I will in any case and UNCTAD will. Uh, also what I said about the, pro the prospective, it's not only what, is hap what, what is happening now, but how trade people could realize that climate will change completely, not only the way to trade, but the trade as such, the routes, the commodities, and when mangoes will be produced in Siberia, well, and of course it's not tomorrow, but uh, it changed completely economy for some countries depending on commodities, and it's why I spoke about diversification, etc. And I think that the link between diversification and climate, and effect of climate on the ground, with two degrees more than today, what will in any case unfortunately happen, I think that that's something could also wake up a little bit the trade people, not only the technicalities, but also in the, in the reality of the trade changing completely, the traditional relationship, and not only the, the war between USA and China, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but other escalation or other changing in trade, uh, um, in trade landscape, if I could say. So, just sorry, I have to go. So, um, I hope that we can continue other places, uh, moment or, or or panels or. Um, discussion can go further with that because I think that it's really, really, really timely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel, for your presentation and also for your participation in the discussion. And, uh, um, uh, we look forward to having further engagement with you on this. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to continue pursuing uh, the subject of uh, regional groupings, uh, coalitions of the willing, call them what you will, because in the the sort of straw poll that we did that came out as the, the preferred solution. Um, I think it was the economist Jagdish Bhagwati who once complained about uh, free trade agreements creating a spaghetti bowl of uh, international agreements and trade that made trade more complex. So I was wondering to what extent the, the pursuing of this option as the second best uh, might compromise the, the possibility of having coherent multilateral solutions and what steps could be taken actually to make sure that these regionalized solutions act as a stepping stone to, to reinforcing the overall global governance of both trade and climate. Um, I'll start with Alan because you uh, dwelt on that, but then I also ask Emily to comment. And in the meantime, please do share questions if you have any, uh, um, uh, I'm this to the audience generally. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I, I think you know, one of the things that we um, need to recognize is that the climate issue is just absolutely the archetypical global public good. Uh, it just doesn't matter where the car 
the first order. It doesn't matter where the carbon is put out, it just affects everybody. Um, and that may, means that we essentially have a global problem. And while uh, sort of the Jagdish Bhagwati concern about the spaghetti bowl was that you were sort of undermining the notion of uh, free and efficient trade, it wasn't such a direct or a global public issue as I think we've got. Uh, my, my concern about regional agreements is, is really just um, uh, whether they have the reach. And that's why I, I sort of was quite interested in the set of results that I used at the end of my presentation, that it looks as if maybe in this one particular case, um, the North-South FTAs, uh, there is some spillover to the partner's other activities. But essentially what we've got to do, I think, is to recognize that we do need to bring nearly everybody along. It's not true to say that it has to be 100% coverage before um, it has an effect, but in a sense, uh, it needs to be getting on towards that and you need to have some assurance that the, uh, the absence of particular players is not going to cause, uh, as it were, resentments that undermine the agreements that you've got. So I think it's excellent if um, uh, countries of Benelux, say, can agree to abolish fossil fuel uh, subsidies and to have a big carbon tax and so on. But that's not quite the solution that the world needs. Uh, you know, Benelux needs to scare France into it, and then they need to scare together the rest of the EU, and it needs to spread out. And, and so um, it's not completely clear to me that, um, well, no, I think it is clear to me that the answer in the long run is not free trade agreements. The free trade agreements might um, contribute by, or your know, plurilaterals might contribute by being essentially testing grounds for ideas, um, proof of concept, the practical issues between, uh, uh, behind many of these questions are really formidable, how you do the measurement. Um, I think you know, uh, that's exactly right, as, as Isabel had said. And therefore doing that on a local basis and then hoping that it's the, you know, can then be generalized out, it becomes, attractive or you're big enough as it were to encourage other people to come along, um, that it seems to me um, uh, they have a role to play. But I don't think we can stop there. I, don't, I think we should not uh, see them anything other than uh, means to an end. My, my turn? Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so actually, I think Alan is one of the people who's been really deeply engaged in this spaghetti bowl uh, debate over the years. And, and it's, it is a, a very parallel question about whether regionalization is a precursor to multilateralization or, or whether it just increases the complexity in, in competing regimes. Um, and I think we're really in that, in that question right now. My hope would be that, um, that that the trains are all moving in the same direction. They're just some of them are moving a bit more quickly than others. So, um, you know, we we can use these um, coalitions of the willing, as as Alan was saying, to trial ideas and see how they work. Um, and then the big guys are going to um, join up, and then you get into the. Uh, coercive market power elements of things where the entire global economy is shifting to to uh, to low carbon. So um, I, I think I would just really underscore Alan's point there. Thank you, uh, Emily. We have uh, about a quarter of an hour remaining. So in that time, there are a couple of uh, other issues that have come up uh, recurrently. And one of those is the question of uh, carbon border, border tax adjustments. I think, Matthew, you use uh, the expression that the that train has left the station in the sense that momentum is really building up uh, for these border tax uh, adjustments. Um, on the basis of what you heard, Matthew, um, uh, do you, uh, uh, from your perspective uh, uh, in uh, the climate change community, how, how would you see the implementation of these carbon border tax adjustments taking place? And would you also like to comment on Alan's statement about uh, taxing consumption relative to production and what possibilities that might offer 
uh, in terms of its contribution to the policy toolkit. Uh, yes, thanks. So on on uh, uh, border carbon adjustments, the Alan is certainly right. The 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 devil is in the detail in the sense that um, how you set them and how you measure accurately the uh, the carbon content of goods that are coming into countries in order to make sure that the adjustments achieve the aims that you're trying to uh, you're trying to achieve to to reduce carbon content. Um, requires to to be understated a lot of work having said that there is a lot of work going on and uh and there may be ways in which you could do it to a degree of approximation that uh that fulfills the that fulfills the objective um going back to some of the earlier points that requires a clearly a large enough economy uh in one respect or another in, to implement them in order to have the types of effects that um that we're looking for whether they're whether they're a good thing they're still they're still distinctly second best right there's still um distinctly a world in which you are um trying to use uh um to paraphrase some things isabel was saying to use trade maybe in, to accomplish uh, policies that trade may not be uh, the best instrument to do. And, and that is in, a res in some respects where you come on to the consumption, the consumption side that you mentioned, Amar. And, um, and, and I think one of the things you will see as you get more and more consensus around, um, domestic consensus in countries around uh, climate action is a greater use of, of consumption policies. I think, uh, uh, production policies politically are often more are often easier to implement, and so you need greater degree of consensus for some of the consumption sides to to fall into place. Um, and as you see, and and so as those grow, there may be there may be less need for uh, for some of these uh, from some of these trade measures. But fu fundamentally, um, the the use of trade as an instrument to decrease carbon intensity, and as Alan illustrated with his example has to be based on this idea that we're part of a dynamic process. It might be true that today some trade increases emissions and other trade decreases emissions. And it may be true that overall trade is, uh, is increasing emissions. The question is in 10 years time, what does that, what does that picture look like? And how do we put in place the trade, uh, the trade policies and the trade instruments to change that dynamic? Because the fact that uh, trade is emissions increasing overall, um, similar, similarly to the fact that trade overall is welfare increasing, is an outcome of, uh, of the current set of rules rather than an inevitable input into those, into those rules. And that's what, that's what we need to work on. And carbon border adjustments may have a role, even if a temporary role, in, uh, in doing that. Thank you. Um, I have a, a raised hand from uh, Derek Rutter. Apologies that if I hadn't spotted that earlier, uh, but would you like to take the floor, please, to um, put your question if, um, uh, if you would still like to? If that was, could give uh, the floor to Derek Rutter. Might have... Uh, no, okay, all right. We can uh, proceed with uh, with our discussion. Um, feel free in the time remaining to send questions through the uh, the Q and A on the chat box. Um, I guess one uh, remaining set of issues. I think uh, in one of the things that came out in the presentation uh, was the, the the appetite for interventionism to decarbonize economies. At the same time, I think Emily. Uh, and Isabel also put, pointed out to the fact that um, uh, advanced countries were uh, taking positions on the use of industrial subsidies by developing countries, uh, notably China, uh, which, which I guess creates two offsetting forces in the sense that uh, you have an appetite to intervene, but you also have an appetite to crack, crack down on policy space for industrial subsidies. Um, is there a possibility there to recalibrate things to uh, 
uh, allow for um, uh, subsidies that are conducive to decarbonisation while uh, restricting the scope for other industrial subsidies? Is there a way that could play out? I'll put that question back to Emily and to, to, to Alan. Emily first, maybe. Emily. Yes, Emily. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think that there's, I didn't mean to uh, suggest that there's only one way forward. I think it's important to press on all fronts. It was more of, of a sort of a feasibility assessment. Um, in a sense, I think what we're looking at is um, an, a huge global increase in uh, subsidies. So um, whether these take the form of uh, state-owned enterprises or whether they're, they take other forms, um, increasingly, I think there's going to be that, that, that narrative um, about the fact that some countries have no separation between private and public sector and other countries do, and if that's not fair, I think we might see that narrative being increasingly challenged. Um, and that is, I think, an artifact of climate change and an artifact of COVID-19. So what does this mean in terms of, I don't think this necessarily will translate into coherent proposals for, for bringing forward an approach to changing the subsidies rules that somehow recognizes um, legitimate state interventions in a more effective way way, um, it might just create a kind of a chaos of, um, of countervailing measures. I mean, we, we could just see, you know, this feeling of, of uh, this chaotic feeling. Um, but I certainly see a strong call to, to, uh, to deal with this in the fora and form in which it should be dealt with, which is WTO negotiations. And I hope some of this can fuel more uh, constructive discussions there. So I don't know if that addressed your question, but <laughs> maybe Alan can do it better. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I can do it, better, <laughs> but I can uh, perhaps uh, uh, do it um, uh, at least um, a little bit differently. I mean, it seems to me that the very strongest argument for the sort of negative integration that the WTO has, uh, you know, the trading system, uh, thou shalt not, is that to the extent that you have policy space, it can lead to, um, you know, essentially competitive races, subsidy races, races to the bottom and what have you. And that eventually you might realize, um, you know, that that is to everybody's disadvantage. Best thing is not to get launched on it. And that's where, in a sense, you know, the role of uh, shallow integration, negative integration. I think the sort of trade-off between the appetite for intervention that is growing in the West and uh, this desire to beat up on China, um, I, I think there are sort of, a, I think one probably needs to subdivide it a bit. Uh, I'm not sure I can completely do this on the hoof, but I think there's one set of issues about uh, subsidies in developing countries, which is this um, age old temptation that uh, the um, industrial country governments have to preserve old industries, you know, to preserve the steel sector, to preserve, you know, the clothing sector or what have you, and that they see subsidies as a sort of direct uh, sort of uh, competitive threat. Uh, the issue with China is, I think, um, partly that, but it is also, of course, then um, a question of the sort of technology sector, and that that links in. Uh, very well, I think, with something that Matthew mentioned about first mover advantage. Um, the concern um, over China is to some extent that China is using its large population for data and its large sort of deep public purse uh, to get first mover advantage in a number of technologies. Some of these technologies, solar panels, for instance, yeah, well, part of the yeah, part of the secret so far as addressing climate change is concerned. And therefore, I'm just not completely confident uh, that the sort of the worry uh, that, um, uh, that, that China will steal a lead here is, 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 I mean, I think that the industrial countries have really got to try and decide uh, that are they seeking to uh, remove um, uh, these interventions 
with a view to uh, establishing sort of a competitive level playing field, um, or do they want to take advantage of the fact that um, uh, subsidies in some of the new technologies, in some of the sort of climate saving technologies, would be in the end to everybody's advantage? And in some sense, I think that's sort of you know, encapsulated in, in, you know, in what Emily was saying. We feel that there are going to be a, a need, a case for subsidies for new technologies. And so something that ruled out all subsidies by the Chinese government might not actually be an efficient way of addressing the, um, uh, the needs of, uh, for addressing climate. So I suspect that um, you know, one needs to subdivide this. And of course, the minute you start to subdivide these problems, uh, people split into sides. You know, in one subdivision, someone's a clear gainer and uh, others are a clear loser. And you can only get agreement on that if you roll it into another, you know, or combine it with another subsector. But then sort of the general rule for each might not be the efficient thing. Thanks, Alan. We just have a couple of minutes remaining, and I'll hand uh, it back to Matthew uh, for a final set of observations. Um, in doing that, I had received a question from Emily Jones, who was struck, struck by the fact that the climate community and the trade community talk past each other a lot. So, Matthew, I was wondering if you could bring some perspective on how we can address that, a better congruence between the two communities. And maybe just in finishing, uh, whether at the end of this session you're leaving more hopeful that your asks will be met, uh, or uh, or whether you think that the road ahead is still very challenging. Thank you. Thanks very much, Amar, and uh, and a great question from Emily because it was it was the one I was pondering to to make my concluding remarks about. Um, and obviously, if there was a if there was an easy answer, then we would uh, then we would have it. But my my main my main thought, other than as Isabel said, sort of getting the, the negotiators and she included digital in that as well as um as well as climate and trade getting the negotiators together in one in one place either virtually or physically um i i think part of the answer is in trying to be clear to each community about what the objectives of the negotiations and the discussions actually are um and uh everyone probably listening to this will will be clear about the trade objectives and uh, and uh, and ideals uh, that are driving trade discussions but from my point of view one of the um one of the big advantages of the paris agreement is the is the clarity it has about the objectives um of climate negotiations of climate discussions and of climate policy and the objectives are very clear. The objectives are around keeping temperatures below, well below two degrees, around making best efforts for 1.5. Um, and, and I think the question then in the discussions with the trade community is, where does that objective fit amongst the list of objectives that trade policy is trying to accomplish? And can we have a discussion about the relative priority of that objective as against other ones? And whether trade is a means to achieving that, or whether the trade trade has some uh, some inherent objective in, it, in and of itself. And for me, that would be then the start of a conversation whereby um, the trade negotiators can think about uh, can think about uh, what the climate objectives are, where they rank in their priorities, and similarly, the trade the climate negotiation can have a better understanding of the types of objectives that are driving trade uh, driving trade discussions. So that's um, that's where I would start, um, and the and the only other point maybe by way of by way of conclusion to say that um, that one of the realizations I think through the climate discussions and the climate process is the dynamism with which we have to address these problems from an economic point of view and the fact that um, that large amounts of trade change, technological, industrial, consumer, is possible and is happening. Um, and viewing sort of the inherent links, as we've come back to a few times, between economic growth and emissions, which have historically been very stable as being an inherent link, um, is, is something that is gradually changing. And I think that has to come into the trade discussions as well. And the inherent links between trade and emissions, for example, that may have been true historically, 
how do we break those down and what's the role of trade rules and trade agreements in helping to do that? Thank you very much, Matthew, and thank you to uh, all our panelists who joined us today. Uh, it's time to wrap up now. In fact, we've overshot by about one minute. And I thank all the participants who joined as well, who took the time to listen on, uh, on this morning. Um, for those of you who joined in and are still there, uh, please stay on. There'll be a poll at the end of this, uh, which the, the organizer, organizers have uh, request, uh, requested you to, um, to fill out. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, thank you to Matthew, uh, Isabel in her absence, Alan and Emily. And uh, I trust you had a fruitful time and uh, we look forward to interacting with you uh, more in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Amos. Thanks very much.